morning. You're back. Don't you have a chess game to watch somewhere? You must be a glutton for punishment. But I'm glad to have you back. Preparing a plaintiff's claim, part two, searches. Now, before we get started, it's very important to make sure that your file is properly organized. So make sure that, of course, you've got a file folder. Make sure that you've got subfile folders. Perhaps even subfile folders with these little metal thingies here. On the other hand, you may want to use some other form of subfile, perhaps just some envelopes uh, which have nice uh, little marked names on them, such as pleadings, correspondence, evidence, searches. If that's not your cup of tea, then maybe some brads. Whatever works for you, make sure your file is properly organized. For the purpose of this video and a few others, we're going to be using the following set of facts as a case study. Our client, Superior Paper Products, Inc., is seeking to commence a small claims court action against a former customer, 1817035 Ontario, Inc., operating as Jolly Good Restaurant for payment of outstanding invoices for goods rendered. The client, when extending credit to Jolly Good, obtained a signed credit agreement wherein the owner of Jolly Good, an individual by the name of Joe Jolly, guaranteed the debts of the corporation. All parties are fictitious. Now with your file organized, we're going to access a website which will allow us to conduct corporate profile and business name searches. Or as I like to say, know your enemy. Now the first thing that we're going to do is search the corporate defendant. We're going to access a corporate or business search site and you can see that this one gives us three options. We can search a corporation, a person, or a business. We can also search that corporation by name, keyword, or as in our case, corporate number. It also asks us for which jurisdiction we'd like to search, uh, including all jurisdictions, but for our purposes, we'll stick with Ontario. We'll then conduct the search. What this will provide us is a corporate profile report. That report will confirm whether or not we have the correct corporate name. It will also provide us with the registered address of the corporation, the name and home addresses of all the officers and directors, as well as other useful information. However, we're not going to stop there. In our case, the corporation is using a business style. Jolly Good Restaurant. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to search that business style. Again, we'll use the jurisdiction here in Ontario. And it's going to provide us with a business names report. And again, that business names report, like the corporate profile report, will confirm the business style that's used by that particular corporation. But we're not done yet. No, 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 no. What we're going to do next is we are going to search our own client, Superior Paper Products. Why? Because our clients sometimes don't give us correct information. So we need to search our own clients to make sure that we have their correct legal name. Also, the corporate profile report will provide us with the names of all the officers and directors of our clients so that we can ensure that we're getting instructions from the appropriate people. Now you should be aware that the Ontario Business Corporations Act, the Canada Business Corporations Act, and the Business Names Act all place limitations on a business's ability to sue. 
In particular, you should make yourself aware of sections 2, 4, and 7 of the Business Names Act and sections 11 and 21 of the Business Corporations Act. Our searches aren't done just yet. Let's assume that our corporate profile report indicated that Joe Jolly resides in Toronto, Ontario. Our next step is to search the land registry office in Metropolitan Toronto. What we're going to do is we're going to type in the address that was given to us in the corporate profile report. And we're going to request what's called an abstract. That abstract is going to tell us a couple of things. First, it's going to indicate whether or not Joe Jolly is his legal name. Perhaps his name is Joseph. Perhaps it's spelt with an F. Perhaps a PH. Perhaps it's not Joseph at all. Maybe it's Giuseppe. Furthermore, the abstract will tell us whether or not Mr. Jolly owns that property, which will be useful when it comes to enforcing a judgment. At this point, you've pretty much completed all of your searches. I'd also recommend that you do a Google search in order to obtain a description of the type of businesses that the plaintiff and the defendant are involved in. You may also want to conduct a PPSA search in order to get a better description of the parties if required. Now, during the filming of this video, a paralegal friend of mine approached me with an interesting case. The plaintiff, while being represented by a paralegal, brought a claim, a plaintiff's claim, against my friend's corporate client. Now, the paralegal who drafted the claim took a look at the contract that had been entered by the parties. Uh, it was entered between the plaintiff, who was an individual, and a business style. Let's just say ABC hyphen crafts with an address. And that is what the plaintiff's paralegal used to describe the defendant. Simply ABC hyphen crafts. Now that's not a legal entity. Nonetheless, uh, the claim was issued. The court clerk didn't mention in anything about the fact that it was not a legal entity. And again, Court clerks are often not trained in this area. A defense was filed. Now, my friend represented the corporation. Now, the corporation has been carrying on business as ABC hyphen crafts. However, the corporation had never registered that name as a business style. In fact, the business style that they registered was ABC crafts, no hyphen. However, when they prepared contracts, they prepared the contracts with a hyphen. Furthermore, on their contracts, they never mentioned their corporate entity. So a defense was filed by the corporation, but of course, the defense contained the name of the defendant, ABC hyphen crafts. It went to a settlement conference. The settlement conference judge didn't mention anything about the fact that ABC hyphen crafts is not a legal entity. And again, we have to understand that many deputy judges aren't trained in this particular area. Deputy judges are not full-time judges. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Some of them are family law lawyers, criminal lawyers, immigration lawyers. They may not have a thorough understanding of corporate law. Well, it went even beyond that. What happened was a notice of trial was sent. However, my friend did not receive that notice of trial. The plaintiff and his paralegal showed up on the trial date. No defendant. The judge presiding on the trial date gave judgment against ABC hyphen crafts. Again, a non-legal entity. The deputy judge presiding at the trial date made no mention of the fact that it was not a legal entity. Now it gets even more bizarre because what happens is a notice of examination is issued and how a notice of examination can be issued with regards to a non-legal entity, I don't know. 
But when my paralegal friend was served with the notice of examination or when she got a copy of it, she brought a motion to set aside the judgment. Now here's what happens. She brings a motion to set aside and the judge at the motion turns to the plaintiff's paralegal and says, this is not a legal entity. Who are you suing? And the plaintiff's paralegal was unable to answer the question, so the judge presiding over the motion adjourned the matter so that the plaintiff's paralegal could do the proper searches, come back on a future date, and advise the court who the defendant was. So they come back on the next date, and unbeknownst to my friend, sometime after the action commenced, the principal shareholder of her corporate client went out and registered ABC hyphen crafts, but he didn't register it as a business style used by the corporation. Instead, he registered it as a sole proprietorship. So the plaintiff's paralegal showed up on the next motion date, advised the court that the defendant was in fact a sole proprietorship and that the judgment would be against the individual. The motions judge, the same judge who had previously presided over the first motion, uh, that is on the first motion date, he then turns to my friend and he says, are you representing the individual? My friend says, no, I represent the corporation. The judge found that since the corporation was not a party to the action, it had no standing to bring the motion. So the motion was dismissed. Now, what that means in the end is another motion is going to have to be brought. It's going to have to be brought by the individual. Now, the interesting thing is this individual has never filed a defense. It was the corporation that filed the defense. This individual never had a settlement conference. It was the corporation who had a settlement conference. This individual may want to file a defense which is different from that of the corporations. This individual may want to file a defense that says he never entered a contract personally. He may want to file a defense that says he's never carried on business personally. His defense may state that he only registered the name ABC hyphen crafts to protect the name. So basically the matter is likely to go all the way back to the beginning. And in fact, what's likely going to be the order is there's going to likely be an order that the plaintiff amend its claim to properly name the defendant. The judgment will in all likelihood be set aside. That is yet to be seen. But again, all of this could have been avoided if the action had have been properly prepared, with proper searches completed. So, with that, um, I'm looking forward to doing the next video, part two. In part two, we'll be looking at the standard procedure or standard part of the small claims court form and how to properly complete the standard form. And with that, have a good week.